now we are now broadcasting live by the way so let's watch the swearing no I'm kidding um, let's watch just watch the slander let's, let's watch, watch, watch the Rolex damn swearing have, okay um, look at him oh there's relic um, yeah, he's been, the, he's been in the booths. <laughs> well, I'm Mike Davis. This is the regular Sunday uh, video chat on Google Hangout. We do this every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so convert that to your time. Um, anyone's welcome to join these most of the time. And... Um, Let's see, today we're going to talk with, for a few minutes to start off with, we're going to talk to Willem, author W.H. Pugmire, about his new book, Bohemians of Sesqua Valley. And then we're all going to chat, or at least I should say, we're all going to start off chatting about uh, Stephen King Lovecraftian stories, but knowing the Lovecraftian <coughs> chats, we could end up talking about anything before it's over with, so who knows. Uh, I'm Mike Davis, founder of Lovecraft Easing. This is Brian Sammons. Um, hey, Brian. Brian's an author and an editor, right? Yes. This, this is Dave Bresky. Am I saying your last name right, Brzezky. Dave? Brzezky. Brzezky. Everybody I'm introducing here is Easing readers and friends. And uh, James Harrison. Glad you're here, James. Token uh, uh, fanboy and uh, cultist, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, that's right. Uh, author Joe Pulver. Um, rich man Pete Rollick. <laughs> now, author author Pete Rollick, who uh, I got to be nice to because he sent me some nice stuff in the mail, so I'll stop teasing him. Um, Mike, he sent me stuff. I'm not going to be nice to you. He sent you stuff, or I sent you well, stuff. You, yeah, I you guess sent I did. Me stuff. You sent me the pretty mouth. Thank you, by the way. Yeah, how'd you like it, Molly's book? Um, Molly Tanzer. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it. I I have a season in Carcosa. Um, uh, and oh, you don't want to read that. I'm straight into Never Never heard heard <laughs> I'll let you know as soon as I get to it. Yeah. I, I haven't read all the stories myself, but that first story in the book, it, it's really, it's really, it's it's a good book, A Pretty Mouth by Molly Tanzer. Um, the wife really liked the cover when I opened it up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, author W.H. Pugmire, he is, um, he is mainly a Lovecraftian author, and he's got a new book, a limited edition. Uh, um, it's coming out first, 150 limited editions signed, right, Willem? Yes, in the end of April. Um, Bo and you can pre-order that. Uh, Bohemians of Sesqua Valley is, is the name of it. It's a short story anthology. Um, for those... I like to do this, well, I like to assume that not everybody knows what we're talking about because okay. we get a lot of viewers. What is what is Sesqua Valley? We all know here, but can you explain it if no one's ever heard of it? When I, be, when I became an obsessed Lovecraftian and began to write mythos fiction, um, I decided to invent my own set place, my own Arkham, Dun Dunwich, that kind of thing in which mm -hmm. to set my stories and um, so I as a kid I, I grew up visiting my cousin cousins in North Bend every two weeks every summer and I, I love North Bend and the Twin Peak Mountain and so I decided that that was going to become my Sesqua Valley and um, when I first began writing the stories, of course, I was very young and a, clue, a clueless, clue mythos kid. Didn't really. All I wanted to do was write cool mythos stories in in the Derelith and Brian Lumley tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and but it's been a wonderful invention for me because it it has limitless possibilities. And um, I tried. To, I tried to keep a, a sense of mystique about the valley. It has strange inhabitants that are non-human or quasi-human. And lately, I've developed the idea that it is adjacent to the dreamland force um, of Lovecraft's dreamlands. Right. And and that's why. 
things like night gaunts and Nyarlat Hotep um, visit the valley so often because they're right next door. In, in the Dream Quest, Lovecraft mentioned that the forests of the Dreamlands touch the earth, the earth um, at two places. And so I decided one of those places was going to be Sesco Valley. That's and, awesome. Yeah, so it's, but <clears throat> my fiction is very character oriented. I like having insane, fascinating characters. Um, they, that keeps the writing interesting for me. And, and, and your, um, your writing, your prose always feels to me like poetry. I mean, it flows, and it, it's got this, to me at any rate, uh, it's got this dreamlike quality to it that that's just so enjoyable. It's, so yeah, it that and that's part. It's it's very supernatural, unlike Lovecraft's fiction. My work is totally supernatural, and the the poetic um, style. Probably well, Lovecraft I think wrote in a poetic style, and um, mm -hmm. so did, and, you know my heroes such as Henry James and Oscar Wilde, and I I, I, I love writing in that kind of old-fashioned poetic. I, I I like to have stories that that read beautifully and are haunting. <coughs> I'm not really into. Um, writing about monsters or gore. Or you, a lot of you, your protagonists, they are the the outsiders, the yeah. monsters, if you want to use that word. And and um, and, and they, they have an allure so that people that visit the valley often want to become <laughs> seduced by alchemy. And, mm -hmm. and instead of running away from, from the horrors, um, people want to be be wedded to the floor. So. Hi, Bruce. Um, now let's talk about. Well, so you've had anthology, <coughs> a lot of lot of short stories in Sesqua Valley, and the newest one is called Bohemians of Sesqua Valley. And uh, I'm going to post the exact link, but anyone interested in going to it right now, before I post the link, it, you can go to miskatonicbooks.com and search for Bohemians of Sesqua Valley. Um, and then a second, I'll let you talk about the limited edition and how that how all that is. But I made a, I did a little drawing that if whoever buys one of these 150 limited editions, pre-orders one, excuse me, before the end of the weekend, midnight tonight, um, I'm going to enter them into a drawing to win one of Joe Brewer's sculptures, which he's created a very beautiful uh, sculpture on one of your characters in, yeah, I in Cisco Valley. So I'll, I'll be giving that away. Joe's agreed to do that. Yeah. That's Simon Gregory Williams. Yes. The, the Beast of Cisco Valley. Oh, that's Jones. the one right there, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yep. Uh, so no. uh, if you go to Wisconsin Books and order the order pre-order the book, then email me the... Um, your email receipt, Michael Davis Writer, just like it sounds at gmail.com, uh, before midnight tonight, and uh, I'll enter you into that drawing. So this is 150 limited editions. Yes. And they're and signed. The Arcane Wisdom Press. They publish beautiful books. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually, the book was unplanned. I I had no idea that I would write this book. And then Necronomicon Providence was announced. And I got so excited about the idea of a Lovecraft convention in Providence that I I became obsessed with the idea that I had to have a new book that would um, be tied to that convention. And so I, I wrote the book over the summer very quickly and... Um, it's, it's going to be dedicated to um, Mr. Hobbs and and the convention. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, anyone viewing it now or, or later, uh, Willem's referring to Necronomicon 2013 this August. Um, 
everybody is going to be there. It seems that's in 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 the Lovecraft world. So, um, what's the date on that? I don't remember. Oh, I can't remember. Do you that. remember anyone? You no. Anyway, it's in August. You can go. You can just Google. I think it's the twenty fourth. Twenty one through twenty three. It might. I don't know. Anyway, Google Necronomicon twenty thirteen. You know. Uh, all right. Before we move on, uh, I've been asking all the questions here. Anybody else want to talk to Willem? Or ask any questions about <laughs> Bohemians of Susquehanna Valley? Or did How I cover many Susquehanna it all? Valley books are there actually at the moment? Because I'm way behind on your stuff and I'm an awful lot of catching up to do. Um, Oh gosh! Um, and how hard are they to find? <laughs> I don't know. I can't. Let's see. Um, maybe four. Most of them are available on Amazon. There's um. Uh, and then some. Of, some of my collections have. A few Sesquil Valley stories, and then other stories as well, mm -hmm. that are not of the series. But then I, I have a book like The Weird Inhabitants of Sesquil Valley, which is all Sesquil Valley stories. Yeah. And um, I know I picked one of yours up at FantasyCon, but I can't actually remember the title off the top of my head. It's in the heap. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so go to miskatonicbooks.com, buy that, email me the receipt, I'll enter you into the contest. Uh, but regardless of whether you win the drawing or not, you're going to be getting a very, very nice, uh, beautiful book signed by Willem. Uh, it's a limited edition. There's 150 only, I believe, in this limited edition, right? Yes. A limited run. Uh, so, Stephen King, uh, I want to say oh, something quick. About, what? Sorry, Mike, I wanted to throw one quick question to Willem, no, if that's no, okay. No, please do. No, uh, please I apologize do. for jumping on there. Um, no, Willem, I'm just well, curious, because I'm... I'm new to uh, your your work. I'm curious what what would be uh, a great book to uh, start off with uh, with your works. Um, probably the fungal stain and other dreams from Hippocampus Press. And, okay. Um, for a more general, um, wide span of my stories, probably Gathered Dust and others. From Dark Regions Press. Okay. No. Um. The only thing I'm I'm familiar with your work is from uh, short stories like Some Buried Memory and the Col the uh, Book of Cthulhu and such. So uh, I'm uh, I'm sure I'm not the only person that goes to Lovecraft's easing that uh, is curious. So I'm hoping that answers for other fanboys like myself. I've got lots of stories on the Lovecraft easing. So. Oh, I've enjoyed yeah. them so far. I'm, I'm, I'm up to issue ten so far. I'm, I'm cool. a slow reader with ebooks. Dave, just so you know, that link I just posted on the side, that's the book depository. They have like eight of Willem's books. Mm -hmm. So that's easy for people in <coughs> the UK and Europe yeah. to get a hold of Willem's stuff at a decent price. And it's free worldwide shipping so that... European readers get to enjoy Willem, not just North American readers. So if you follow that link, you'll that'll take you to a whole bunch of great stuff. Joe, we don't want to share. <laughs> <laughs> and let's welcome the beautiful and talented Molly Tanzer. <laughs> she looks like Drinks like a fish. What? She yeah. does? That's right. You guys went and got hung over together recently, didn't you? This one's for you, Molly. <laughs> I hope she had a good time on the yacht. I don't you think... have to ask her. Is your mic on? I can't hear you if you're talking. I guess not. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No, I, Mo no we can hear Molly. you, Pete. We can't hear Molly. Yeah. There we go. Oh, there you go. All right. Whoa. Yeah, there is a pretty mouth right there. Oh, and there's you, the book too. <laughs> I look forward to reading it. It's in oh. my pile. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about you yeah, five minutes ago, Molly. Oh. All terrible yeah. things, by the way. I can't believe the things Mike said. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's why my ears were burning. Yeah. I thought so, it was oh. just red sickness in World of Warcraft, but here it was. People were gossiping. 
So anything else on Bohemians we want to before we oh, move yeah. on? So buy it. Miskatonicbooks.com. Pre-order it, I should say. Um, there's a lot of popular authors out there that, you know, they cater, they, they write stuff that appeals to the masses, and I don't think much of them, and, you know, probably a lot of serious writers don't. But then there's a guy like Stephen King who, in my opinion, not everyone's going to agree with me, he's, he is a really good writer, and at the same time, he's really popular. So, um... I do enjoy reading his stuff. I especially enjoy reading his short stories, and he's such a popular author that it occurred to me that maybe we could have a short discussion about uh, his um, um, Lovecraftian stories. So, you know, I've got a little list here. Um, it, anybody else want to comment on that? I mean, let's see, I've, I've got one, two, three, four... Five, six, seven. Um, seven. I don't think I've read them all then. <laughs> seven so far. I was working, I, I I was working on the list whenever I. What? I assume one of them has to be Jerusalem's Lot. Yeah. Yeah. One of them's Jerusalem's Lot. Uh, I am the doorway. Uh, okay, the, I think I prefer that. The mist. That's night shift. I've got I am the doorway and Jerusalem's Lot. In Skeleton okay. Crew, I've got The Mist yeah. and Mrs. Todd's Shortcut, which I'll talk a little bit about that one. It's not real a real, real well-known story, I don't think. And then in Just After Sunset, um, N, the letter N, that's the name of the, the story. Uh, Nightmares and Dreamscapes has Crouch End. And Stephen King and his son, Joe Hill, just wrote a short story that's available on Kindle called uh, In the Tall Grass. I don't know if any of you guys have read that. But it's, no. like, it's like two ninety nine or something. And, oh, man, that, you know, I read a lot of horror. That is one scary and very disturbing short story. It's about these, uh, this brother and sister, they're really close, and they're driving cross country, and they they roll down the the windows are rolled down in the car, and so then they they hear this voice this kid calling from this field, and it's it's early spring it's like March or April or something, and this field has this real real tall grass hay slash whatever, uh, it must be seven or eight feet tall, and they hear this kid saying I'm lost and and you know so they pull over. And they go in there, and as they both get in there, they get separated, and they can't find their way back to the road. And I thought it's such a simple, brilliant concept, if you think about it. Um, you enter into this field, and it keeps them prisoner. And I won't spoil any of the rest of the, the plot, but it's it's very Lovecraftian. So, and where is this again? It's called In the Tall Grass. No, where can you uh, read it? Oh, it's Kindle, and it's also available on Audible. Oh, okay. But isn't that Joseph Payne Brennan's uh, Canavan's Backyard? Hmm? I mean, Joseph Payne Brennan wrote the story, Canavan's Backyard, which is the same story. I haven't heard of that one. What's that one? It's I think it's in Nine Nightmares in a Dream. Well, tell us but, about it. Yeah. A uh, guy inherits a house. He, the yeah. backyard is overgrown. He hears things in the backyard. He wanders in. He can't get out. Really? What What happens after that? New neighbors move in. And they go into the backyard. <laughs> no, I, it, no, I mean, what happens to him? It's left undetermined. The huh. next, the next people move in to to try and do the next, you know, the next victims. Well, sounds like this is a bit different. The hook right. is the same. All right. And then um, Caitlin Kiernan did it, the same thing in uh, in The Red Tree. Well, no one likes cutting the grass. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's true. Well, you know, one of the things that occurs to the two characters as they get lost is that the grass should not have been that tall in April, you know. So it's in. it takes place in Kansas. 
So it shouldn't have been shouldn't have been that tall in April. And it's just a, I don't I can't even tell you why it's creepy without giving away the plot. All right. But it's one of the, one of the few stories I've read that I was like that is so horrible. I'll never read that again. Um, it, yeah, it's such a great story. I mean, it's really well written. For everyone else not to read ever again. Yeah, yeah. Is it horrible in a in a physical violent gross way or just atmosphere? Uh, the atmosphere is is Lovecraftian, which I like and I'm used to. But some of the things that the characters resort to doing. Uh, is the most disturbing thing I think I've ever read. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you definitely want to read it. <laughs> so, so who's got a? Uh, well, like one one more thing. You you mentioned Skeleton Key, it, Grandma and Skeleton Key. That's and, right. And and Yog Sothoth is mentioned in there. Hastur, and we have the switching of the bodies at death, which. You could say is reminiscent of thing on the door thing stuff. On the door stuff, yeah. So is that a uh, grandma? Yeah. Grandma, yeah. Yeah. I was I gonna mention that one in a very long time. Yeah. You should, uh, Mike. Yeah. I know what you need. Yeah, I remember that one. Mentions the Necronomicon. Yeah, there's there's a couple more. It seems to me that just in passing mention the Necronomicon. Pet Cemetery mentions Athaqua. Yeah. Uh, Eyes of the Dragon has a nod to the Necronomicon. Randall Flagg has it, the evil wizard in that book. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tommy yeah. Knockers mentions the Mountains of Madness. Uh, yeah. What to differentiate between, like, the ones that had that nod to the mythos and the ones that are, I think, actually Lovecraftian? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jerusalem's uh, Lot. Sorry? Jerusalem's Lot. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I haven't read it for years, but to me... That seems authentically, delightfully Lovecraftian. I love that stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, what? I agree. I actually just read it again recently. It's a, it's a, it's a great story. And one of the ones I like that is doesn't link to the uh, mythos, but I think is generally Lovecraftian is Children of the Corn. He who <laughs> walks behind the rose. Yeah. Hmm. Why do you think it's Lovecraftian? You, it, it come, at first, it comes off as a as a Christian parable gone bad. You know, right. very died in the wool Christian mytho Christian mytho story. I flip it around completely, and I say that's a whole new mythos monster. You walk behind the rose is just bang on. It's like he who should not be named. It's just a a nice a new point. deity. Okay. One that I always thought had Lovecraftian overtones. And I still wasn't getting the name right, but it, uh, it was sort of like King's sci fi story. I think it's called The Long Sleep. The Long Jaunt? Oh, the Long Jaunt. jaunt. That's it. The Jaunt. It's just the, the jaunt. jaunt. The Jaunt, yeah. I, I always enjoyed that one. Yeah. The whole idea that uh, people invented a way to teleport, but they can only do it if they're sleeping. Otherwise, they go mad. Well, yeah. Uh, what happens if you really don't go to sleep during that teleportation? And the ending of that story, I always thought was great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, in the story, um, the a little kid, ten or eleven years old, I think he he holds yes. his breath and doesn't take the knockout gas. And it, you know, it, it go ahead. I was say if I'm wrong, maybe he doesn't physically age, but they hint at the idea that. It actually takes much longer for you to make the travel if yeah. you're awake than asleep, and essentially that's what happens to you. Yeah, he's awake in some kind of white no dimension where he can't do anything for like millions of years. You know, is the impression I got. Yes. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Um, so Jerusalem's lot is in um, is in his first collection, Night Shift. And then the other story that I feel is Lovecraftian in that collection is a story called I Am the Doorway. Does anyone remember that one? I've read it, but I don't remember it. I know I've read all of Night Shift, but it was a long, long, long time ago. Yeah. yeah. That's what yeah, the eyes. gets all the eyes on him? <coughs> yeah. yeah. He, he yeah. goes out into space, uh, I, I forget, on some kind of mission or something, and he comes back, 
and he realizes that that something's inhabiting him and uh, when he sees humanity through its eyes it, it, he sees how repulsed it is and so forth and that seemed very Lovecraftian to me yes um, skeleton crew of course you got the mist and grandma yeah and then um, anyone here a fan of the mist talk about the mist and why you think it's Lovecraftian I haven't read the mist in a long time but the movie now, regrettably I've only seen the movie uh, the mist not read the book which you know terrible bad of me which but, was uh, pretty good I didn't like the ending but I think a lot of people say that well I actually I really liked like the ending of the movie I thought the ending I thought the ending was quite suitable yes well let me ask you a question do you guys have kids no yes. see <laughs> yeah I'm with you Mike I cannot watch the mist because of the ending yeah uh, I actually uh, I have a well She's popped on once or twice when I'm here, but uh, I have a, a almost two-year-old daughter, and um, that's why I like the ending on The Mist so much yeah, because it, it actually tugs horrifying. on some real, real terrible hard strings. No, does that happen in the in no, the story? No, I can't remember. That it does not happen like that. Yeah. It's very open-ended. Um. Now I, I'm kind of back and forth on whether this one's really Lovecrafty or not because. Someone refreshed my memory on the story. The the army or something. They don't they open a portal to another dimension or something. Yeah. And some monsters come out. Well, that's the explanation. But yes, it's um. This is me going from the movie. So if I'm deviating from the short story, please someone jump in. Yeah. But, uh, essentially, what happens is it's a small town. There's a there's of course the government army uh, on the outskirts of it. They something happens and this mist just pours through. Mm -hmm. uh, the town, and they're all confused and worried, and little creepy things start popping out of the mist, and then you just get one person screaming down down the street, going, run, run, and everyone just sort of boards up all the windows and doors, and uh, little things start hitting the windows. And you A get good policy when that sort of thing happens more than yeah. four and uh, a lot of terrible things happen, and of course, because it's Stephen King, you always have some religious zealot pop up and try and take charge, which is always interesting. Yeah. And, uh, well, I don't want to keep going further on because it spoils, spoils the well, movie. Uh, do you guys feel it was Lovecraftian, or was it just like, yes. ten, was it tentacles? Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a way, it, it, on the surface, it does feel very um, like, oh, look, we've got tentacles and horrible, unspeakable monsters kind of thing. Yeah, but there is that atmosphere of uh, dread, and um, well, especially with the ending of the movie, you just there, it is a it feels like a hopeless situation. Yeah, which is even more compounded when you see the cover, like the the actual ending. So you know, sometimes I struggle putting into words simply what is Lovecraftian, well, but as far can. as the cosmic fear goes, I was watching one of the trailers for the new Star Trek movie, Into Darkness. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say Star Trek, this new Star Trek movie is Lovecraftian. I, I'm just, the. it starts off with the, uh, I guess the bad guy in this movie, he starts off with, he says, you think your world is safe, but it's an illusion. Um, you know, a comforting lie make, uh, uh, said to make you feel, told to make you feel safe. And I thought, that really sums up Lovecraft. You think your world is safe, but it, it's an illusion. You know, so you, you know the old ones are coming back, or whatever. Whatever particular Lovecraftian story you're reading, uh, you know, it's not going to end well. <laughs> is the theme. So, did anyone anyone remember Mrs. Todd's shortcut? Yeah, no, she's always looking for the the shorter way and the shorter way and the shorter way to get. Yeah, to wherever she's going, and she takes a doozy. Yeah, she ends up. Uh, it's this lady that really likes. It's her hobby finding shortcuts. So she tells a, a friend of hers, this guy, the guy telling the story, that she's found. She mapped out a real short path, and it, and it, and she drove it from one city to the other. When she goes, it's a regular round trip thing that she does to another city. And he figures out that that's less than the crow flies, you know, less mileage than the crow flies, you know, so how's she doing that? 
And then it just, you know, it, it struck me as sort of Lovecraftian because she's obviously traveling through some sort of other dimension. And then when he goes with her once, you know, it just seems, everything seems off and, and things are reaching for the car and, and things like that. It's one of my favorite Stephen King short stories, actually. So, um, I don't know if this comes across as Lovecraftian, but I definitely um, felt that that sense of uh, the there's far more underneath with uh, fourteen oh eight. The the just the, the fact the that room. you have the pardon the hotel room. Yes, yeah. I, I loved the that story, both the movie and the book. Um, and that's one that I got to admit I haven't read the story. Okay. Uh, just, but I've seen the movie, which was very good. Was this was the short story more Lovecraftian than the mm. movie, or? I I would say it's it's um not as not as as uh, I'm a, probably a terrible uh, judge of it, but uh, I found I found the the movie felt more Lovecraftian to me. Just um, you have this uh, I guess atheist Ghostbuster kind of guy. Yeah, real skeptical. Thing. Yeah, and uh, I like the fact that he scratches the surface and finds terrible things underneath. And finally finds what he's looking for, so to speak. That one passed me by totally. I've never even heard of it. Oh, <laughs> the movie or the book. <laughs> um, do, give, do give the movie a chance. Um, Samuel Jackson Cusack, just yeah. has a great little cameo in it. Well, I guess short part in it, not cameo. Who... Dude, so Samuel L. Jackson? Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, just the line itself. Uh, when the guy says, is it a ghost? Is it, uh, is it this? Is it that? And he goes, no, it's just an evil effing room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another one of my favorite lines from the movie is uh, that Samuel L. Jackson says something, and they're kind of verbally batting back and forth, and he goes, he goes, well, you do drink, do you? Samuel L. Jackson says that to John Cusack. John Cusack says, uh, well, yeah, I just said I was a writer. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, wait a minute now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's plenty of writers who do not drink. I'll oh, make up all our vices, right, Joe? No, I don't drink anymore. So. <laughs> but those of us who don't drink chain smoke. Yeah, so has to be something. That's right. Um, you guys are pretty quiet today. I think you're out of practice. Um, I'll right, throw you a curveball. Mm -hmm. Storm of the century. Do you think that's Lovecraftian? I, I, I guess he I, could be I, some I, kind I, of god, yeah. I flip on it. I don't know. I mean, the whole concept oh. of this, this thing that's been stalking the earth for thousands of years, recruiting replacements for itself, mm -hmm. I don't know. I've, I've mm -hmm. wanted to read Storm of the Century. Um, it was basically I'm just curious. written as a screenplay, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he wrote it just for film. I, I enjoyed the TV show. They published a screenplay in book form, so if you do want to read it, it's available. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I very know, much enjoyed it. Do we know Stephen King's opinion of Lovecraft? I seem yeah. to re I seem to remember when I read his book um, that he wrote about the horror genre. Yeah, dance macabre. Yeah, weird attitude about I'm not going to talk about Lovecraft, and I can't remember his reason. It, for really, because what I have read is that he thinks very highly of Lovecraft. In fact, he <laughs> he inter I think there's a quote that a lot of people quote Stephen King. He says something like, "The Lovecraft's the most influential horror writer of the 20th century," or something like that. Hang on. I just I just remember reading his his book, yeah. his like expanded essay on the horror genre. And he said, um, he said I don't know like, if you could see that. Lovecraft, Lovecraft has been spoken of, of to death, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there with his book. On the uh, Necronomicon, the best weird tales of H.P. Lovecraft, on the back in lovely golden gloss, gloss here it says, Lovecraft opened the way for me as he has done other for others before me. Well, then also the book um, H.P. Lovecraft. Um, Against the World, Against Life by Michael, however you say his last name, or Mikkel Hellebalak. I'm probably saying both names wrong. You guys familiar with that book? It's a really good book about Lovecraft. Um, anyway, Stephen King wrote the introduction to it. Hmm. If you guys haven't read that, Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft, Against the World, Against Life, it's really good. 
So I haven't read it. No. But yeah, I, I, he may be sick of talking about Lovecraft, but uh, Willem. But I think he thinks a lot of Lovecraft. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was there was a talk. Yeah. I think you posted a link to uh, Mike, uh, Stephen King giving a talk at some college yeah. or other. And he, uh, somebody asked him about Lovecraft, and he, he was a little bit dismissive. He said, like, I really liked him when I was young, but I've like, progressed beyond that stuff now. It was that the impression I got? But anyway, well, it actually you know, quite I, surprised me. I don't like the attitude of, of Lovecraft as something that you start off with and progress beyond. I, I disagree mm. with that totally. Me you too. If, if it's something that he's progressed on, then his son has definitely picked it up again because uh, if you read his uh, graphic novel Lock and Key, uh, yeah. he, he's very Lovecraftian with that. I, know, I yeah. read the first he's ever issue of the comic. <laughs> what, Brian? Uh, and at Lock and Key, he even names the town Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah. and Shubnagaroth uh, pops up. Yep. And uh, there are some horrible, horrible moments in that in the story, which are absolutely great. Um, so if his fa- if Stephen King has decided that he's moved off of uh, Lovecraft, I guess he's handed all his books to Joe and decided, hey, well, here you go. Well, See like I said, with. he wrote a Lovecraftian, in my opinion, short story recently with with his son in the tall grass. Mm-hmm. And you guys, yeah, when but, you read that, but, you guys are going to curse me because it's yeah. But don't don't pick on King if he thinks that that's something sort of tied to youth and he's moved on. That's not so dissimilar to Ramsey Campbell's opinions. I mean, mm-hmm. the, Campbell yeah. still adores Lovecraft and praises him highly, but, but Campbell is, is the same thing. It's like, I did that when I was young, I worshipped it, I adored it, and I moved along. That, that unto itself isn't a dismissal or a negative as far as Lovecraft. That's just, as a writer, I I, I've kept going, you know. Um, that, yes. It's not. It's not necessarily a negative. It, it, no, it, it's a common. It's a common philosophy of young horror writers that, that Lovecraft is a phase we pass through on our way to our own voice and vision. And that's why I have said no, and that Lovecraft was was going to be my voice and vision. So I, I'm, I'm fighting against that idea in my you know, book. You know, as, as writers, we all travel our own path. It, mm-hmm. Each writer, no, no matter how many our similarities are, and you, you can start comparing us, and if we have a, you know, columns, yeah, they all do this, most of them have done that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, we all go in our own directions. I mean, if you look here, look at Brian's work. Look at Molly's work. Look at Peter's work. Look at Willem's work. No, don't look at my work. I, I'm not saying that. It, I'm not. Argue, I, I totally agree with you, Joe. I'm just saying the attitude that Lovecraft is something you start off with, and, and it's sort of juvenile. That that kind but of not everybody like starts with. with Lovecraft. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean that that horror writers start with Lovecraft. That that's absolute bull. I, I don't know who. A, a lot of us do. A lot of us come to Lovecraft because he's so popular. I, I mean, once once we had all those Ballantine books in as as mass market paperbacks in the '60s. Once Lovecraft was on every college campus, the way that Dune was, the way that Lord of the Rings was. I mean, it's what American college kids in the '60s were reading. Robert E. Howard. Love, Lovecraft became popular enough to enter our consciousness, mm-hmm. you know, and and start to enter the pop world, you know, and stay there. How many authors are as widely published as Lovecraft? So for people who are interested, younger people who are interested in horror, naturally Lovecraft is there. It's easy to get a hold of. Lovecraft is like Stephen King. You, mm-hmm. you, you can find it readily. So it, it, it becomes attractive or it attaches itself to younger people, a lot of them. And if they want to write, yeah, a lot of people play with it. But whether you're a musician, whether you're a painter, you know, whatever, it, it, if you ha- truly have that artistic drive, the way a lot of these writers in front of you or on the screen have, you're gonna. You also 
you know, have other interests, and and you'll go in other directions. Molly, would um, you please be quiet? You're talking too much. What me? No, I. Yeah, be quiet. I haven't read a lot of Stephen King, so I, I'm I'm learning today. Uh, Mike, she's an innocent young lady, and you should leave her alone. Oh, okay. that's what I heard. All right. Just okay. I yeah, I believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very well, proper. Thank you. What, Molly? I said I am very prim and proper. Thank you very much. Yeah, right. Uh, did yeah, you, I, good, I, did I, you guys I have totally a good time in Florida? Florida? We did, except that Pete thinks that I was a bit. He was trying to get me to be rowdier than I am by nature. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, totally. I want. I want to ask you all a question. Yeah. You know, we're talking about Stephen King writing in the Lovecraftian mode. Mm -hmm. Have any of you written fiction in the Stephen King mode? And does he? How how would you describe? Him. I did. How 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 is Stephen King himself in the way that Lovecraft is Lovecraftian? So explain this to me. Okay, St Stephen King is contemporary. I mean, he may he we may have a um, small town New England village, but we're we're writing contemporary. These are people of today. They're also every man. This this Everyone, guy can yeah. be a plumber. This guy can be a car mechanic. Um, Just to jump in real quick, Joe, one of the things I heard about the, uh, that I read about from Stephen King, he said, "My in my horror, bad things can happen to to anyone, and it's best not to ask why. It just happens." And 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 that's one of the things that makes it so wonderful. It's one of the reasons he connected when he first mm -hmm. came along. Um, we seem to be bo boring Molly. I'm no, sorry. No, 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 I'm stretching. With a big um, yawn as well. Um, <laughs> King, King in his own way, when King comes along, changes the direction of horror. King's writing, in the, and that's the perfect statement, that bad things can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. They can happen to the guy who uh, works at Walmart. They can happen to a maid. You know, we don't we step away from love, the lofty Lovecraftian criticism. You know, professor this, uh, academic that. You know, I mean, those 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 people were not every man. And and Stephen King brings it right to the block where your house is. Very mm -hmm. true. Yeah, yeah. I that, think that sums it up better than anything. Yeah. To yeah. add to that, Joe, one of the things I think King does really well when he's on his game is dealing with. Kids becoming adults. Oh. Yes, I, I don't. I don't know that anyone in horror can do kids half as good as King. Right. I, I mean, everybody picks on like King. Barker, maybe, but yeah, I don't think Bart. Uh, no, because because King again is every man. He's right mm -hmm. on your street. I mean, if you look at it, the body. Yeah. Oh my gosh! It is. Probably one of the the best, I, and I'm surprised that didn't pop up for uh, Lovecraft yet. Oh, I've got yeah. a little thing. I, I haven't sewers. mentioned it yet, but yes, it's on my list. Yeah. Okay, when when yeah, he's that. on his game and he's doing kids dealing with things that are not things kids deal with, and becoming an adult and learning how to be an adult, and then thinking that you're an adult and then realizing that you're still a little kid and you have to deal with these things. Those are the things that King does really well. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I just sent all you guys a link, and I'll post this for, for people watching this later. Uh, but I read last night, and I've got it up in front of me now, a really good article uh, someone wrote about Stephen King and, and Lovecraft back in 2005. And it, it talks about, mainly it, talk, it talks a little bit about Pet Cemetery, but it talks about it quite a bit and yeah. why it's Lovecraftian and it's a very very good article I, I really don't think you I know, can sum it up. I, I remember that article I remember yeah. reading that yeah. Well, it's on the uh, right yeah. side of your screen here if anybody wants to glance at it uh, and I'll post it for the people that view this later. Thank you for the good conversation. I'm gonna tough, I'm gonna check some of these things out, but I've got a dip. So oh no um, problem, Molly. Nice Thanks for coming. Bye, Molly. Bye, Molly. Bye, Molly. Bye, Molly. Bye, Molly. Um, yeah, that's a good article. I, I, I really like the one part here um, where we're discussing Penn Cemetery. 
that mm -hmm. that paragraph, a few down, is 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 real good. Um, the one under. Oh, the Wendigo. Uh, Talking yeah. about yeah. Yep. Um, one, two, third paragraph down. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good article. It it, it hits a lot of points exactly. Uh, without references, without reference to names from Lovecraft's mythos, Pet Cemetery hints that the Wendigo, first introduced as a cannibalistic spirit feared by the Indians of New England and Canada, may be a cosmic entity like Lovecraft's gods. And then it goes on for there. I won't read the whole thing, but this is a uh, this is just a really good article. Yeah, I'm glad it's, I found it's a it. very nice piece. Uh, and it really delves into it and why it's Lovecraftian. And, you know, I have not read the book in so long that I might as well almost not have read it. Um, I'm going to read it again. The, the series, the short, the mini-series, while okay, definitely did not come across as Lovecraftian to me. Oh. The mini-series with the kids was really good with the adults. The second part of the mini-series was just horrible. I agree. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Yeah. yeah. It, it, uh, it's kind of funny that we don't have a lot of really incredible Lovecraftian film, and Stephen King, we don't have a lot of incredible King. For, for whatever reason, you take the horrious or genres, two greatest 20th century writers, arguably, mm -hmm. and, and their stuff has not been well, overall you know, this, or mostly done properly on film yet. Uh, it's, it's interesting because the Stephen King stuff that does translate to film you're right, Joe, is not really, per se, the horror stuff. It's like uh, no, the Shawshank Redemption one, and things like that. Misery is wonderful, um, you know, but it's just odd that you take two, two, two authors with such rich bodies of work and, you know, where's a, a Peter Jackson to come along and, like, really be in love with this work and get it right, you know, uh, or or whatever, director, you know. Has anyone read Under the Dome? I heard they're going to make that into a movie. No, I have That is we'll one doorstopper of a book, man. <laughs> that is a huge well, book. With nothing wrong with fat books. If no, it, there's not. Know, it, a fat book is, is a wonderful, wonderful thing it's, if it's well done, you know. Um, well, to bring up your point, Joe, with uh, movies that haven't been made properly, um, I think it's mainly Hollywood not wanting to risk putting out something they don't think will sell. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of attempts, and they look at it, and before it's finally made, uh, they, they kibosh it and change it to what they think it should be. Yeah. Um, a great example I just read in Rue Morgue was Nightbreed where um, they changed the whole premise of the whole story of the monsters being the good guys. And back when that movie came out, the, the execs basically said, no, we're not going to make this. Uh, this movie's too makes the monsters too relatable. I guess uh, Del Toro's Mountains of Madness, <coughs> that got killed, was that Del Toro wanted to go for an R rating. Yeah. And, and Universal would not give him 150 million bucks to make a movie with a horror movie with an R rating right. because somebody like Universal doesn't want Brian Sammons or Pete Rollick. They don't care about you. They care about, at least their perception, is some 15-year-old kid who's going to mm -hmm. go six times. Right. Yeah. And if it's R rated, he can't get in. Well, I'll tell you what, though, Del Toro sneaking in some... Uh, uh, yeah. uh, looking at the preview in a way, sneaking in some Lovecraft into Pacific Rim. Yeah, he always has. That yeah. looks like a, a, a great popcorn movie that we'll go watch. Just yeah. You know, did, did anyone uh, see the trailer? It talks about uh, aliens coming from another dimension through a portal at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. You know. So I'm like, all right, that's good. It's part of in the mountain madness. I've heard that he hasn't. Even up on it completely, he still is yeah. only he he'll make it. Yeah, in a recent interview, he 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 inferred that he is not done. Okay. Um, yeah. If, if, if Prometheus if Del Toro already... can get a hit, I mean, let's face it. Let's look at his output. He's not a big money maker. 
No. Del, Del Toro may be well respected with fans. Fans may adore him, but at the box office, yeah. he's not a cash cow. No. At the studios, they care about the bottom line. That's yeah. it. So you know, just because this guy's got a staggering reputation in a in in some boardroom, it's in some studio in Hollywood, that don't cut the mustard. Well, it's true. I, I mean, Seth Rogen was all excited when he got picked to do a movie with uh, Kevin Smith. Uh, Zach and Mary make a porno. Yes. And his um, his agent was like, you know that Kevin Smith movie don't make money. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's the bottom line. You know, I mean, whether it it's... What, no matter what the medium is, whether it's music, whether it's film, whether it's writing, we live in a world where the creators are a lot of them and hopefully are trying to be artistic but the delivery system is based on capitalism they don't care how art poet you know that Willem's poetic Willem's very artistic um, they don't care mm. yeah you know they, they can do Fifty Shades of Cthulhu and make more money. <laughs> you know, I mean, Brian, Brian will know a lot more because he's far more tapped in the film than any of us. Um, but it, but it seems like just the production machine itself really has no interest in artistic value. It does uh, That's why you get just this weekend you get Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Really? Yeah, the second remake. I mean, they just remade it eight years ago. Yeah, and Spider-Man. Spider-Man's done four movies inside of a decade. God. You know? Well, I, I just ordered Night Shift on Amazon. Oh, you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so you have sold a Stephen <laughs> King book. Yeah, <laughs> he's going to retire off of, off of this, yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things about Night Shift that I really enjoy is, uh, besides the stories, is his introduction. He's, he's writing this introduction in February of 77, I believe it is. And he's alone in the house. He says, where I am, it's it's dark and raining. And he writes the whole introduction. And you really feel like you're hanging out with, there with him. Uh, it's just a, it's a really neat introduction. So... Be sure and check that out. Well, I'm going. To, I'm going to split everyone because I'm really tired. Okay. And um, it was nice meeting you, Willem. Yes, it was lovely chatting with you all. Good and to see you. Later. We'll see you all later. Good to see you. Okay. Bye bye. Right. Bye, Will. Um, I want to go over the rest of my short list of Lovecraftian short stories. Oh, I was going to say we I... haven't mentioned Crouch End yet. No, and see if um, I'm missing any. And I, then I want to ask all you guys what your favorite one is. Um, we talked about it. Uh, you just mentioned Crouch End, and that's in Nightmares and Dreamscapes. And then just after Sunset, I mentioned N. Something about Crouch End. Um, Tim Curie reads that on audio. Uh, and I've read it, and I've listened to Crouch End, and listening to it, just like the short story in really adds an element of creepiness that it adds an extra dimension that's not there in just reading the story and I highly encourage listening to both of those stories um, in and crouch in but that that that's not an uncommon occurrence okay no. uh, yeah. there's a guy a guy in Scotland who's putting some of my stuff to music and I'll be one right of back. the things he picked out you know, he he mentioned the title, and I, you know, I vaguely remembered the title, and I said, oh, okay, yes, cool, do whatever, you know, do whatever you want, and um, I I I didn't remember it, and when I went and looked at it, I didn't think much of it, you know, so I didn't think anything, and then he sent me a demo, and just listening to him read the text with. With, with music behind it. I, I was like, sh I loved his voice, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, maybe that piece isn't as bad as I thought it was. You know, it, uh, there, some, sometimes hearing a piece read 
we'll, we'll give it other other dimensions, new dimensions. Um, Plus, I mean, as an author, when you hear your story read, it's just there's some fabulous so great. work. There's some fabulous work on closed on account of rabies. The Poe tribute uh, from what is that? A decade ago, twelve years, something. Um, you know, Gabriel Byrne has got a fantastic reading. Diamond Gallus reading the Black Cat. Man, I I have difficulty getting through that whole tale. She just creeps the shit out of me, and, and I love the Amanda Gallus. I mean, I'm a big fan, but, you know, um, so, yeah, so often listening can, can give us totally new dimensions into the work. Julia, um, who's not here tonight, Julia yeah, Morgan. She, she does she, um, wonderful stuff. Yeah, and the, the story, the, the piece I wrote, uh, Pikmin's Marble, which... Mike published. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it's told from the point of view of a, a a woman, and I I had this whole voice in my head, and she just nailed it. She did a great job. Yeah, my my story in issue eleven, <clears throat> I am the key. I it, it as a as a writer, when you hear your story read and and read well, it's it's really a great feeling too. I'm sure you guys can relate. Yeah. That. Is this stuff of yours, Joe, read by the Scottish guy to music actually available anywhere? We can get Not it here. Yet. Right? He's, he's working on a bunch of it. He's He wants to do something in particular with it. And so he's he's finished two tracks. He's working on two more. He has plans for a fifth and perhaps a sixth. And then we'll see if how he wants to deliver it. If that opens up, and we'll go from there. Um, you know. Uh, Have you guys ever ever uh, listened to a story that's been read by two different people, mm -hmm. and found yeah. that one person seems to get it right, and the other just sort of falls short of the mark? Definitely. Uh, yeah, I found I that Stephen King books definitely uh, need the right reader. And I don't, I don't like it when King reads his own stuff. No, no, King cannot read his own stuff. Mm -mm. Uh, no, if he ever listens to this, sorry, Stephen. Uh, but <laughs> well, some writers, uh, some writers are very good at delivering their own work, and some aren't. You know, um, I'm horrible well, at it. If I you have want to interest um, Guillermo del Toro's book, um, the one with the vampires, The Strain, is read by Ron Perlman. Mm. And that's uh, very different, especially when he tries to read for the uh, female parts in it. But, uh, <laughs> I can't imagine Ron Perlman trying to do female voicing. It's it's quite humorous. I'll I'll, I'll give it that. Well, Some like people just in got the, too in strong the, an accent. <laughs> in the in the short story "In" by Stephen King, they actually have three different readers. Each 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 character, the main three characters. They have a woman doing <clears throat> doing the protagonist's sister. They have a man doing um, the protagonist, and then the the, the, the his patient in uh, is another male voice. And I, I thought that worked really, really, really well. So the other thing about in whenever I mention in to 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 people here, they're always like, "Yeah, it sounds okay." And, you know, I'm a real big advocate of that story, especially reading it. If you guys haven't read it, or excuse me, especially listening to it. Anybody watching this, if you haven't read it, or even if you have, definitely listen to it. And I defy anybody to listen to it in bed at night with the lights off and not be seriously creeped out. So, um, have you guys all read in? Yeah, no. I have not. I'm, I'm Billion making a years ago, list of stuff that I want to pick up. It's it's fairly recent. It came out a couple of years ago. Brian, you said you read it. <laughs> um, it, it's about this guy that <clears throat> he's he's uh, he's writing down his notes. Uh, he committed suicide, and his sister starts off the story, and then she starts reading his notes about a patient who he who he only refers to as in, and this <clears throat> this patient came to him, and. He's got um, 
my mind just went blank. Where you are always counting stuff and double checking stuff. What's that? CDO. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's like OCD. Yeah. But it's in alphabetical order. OCD. Thanks. I, I'm sorry. My fibromyalgia is kind of embarrassing, but sometimes really common words go right out of my head. But um, happens to us all. Yeah. OCD. Yeah, he's he, he's got OCD. Um, at least that's the initial thing that the psychiatrist thinks. But it, he went out. He's a he, his hobby is photography, and he went out and took a picture of this field with seven stones in it. But when he looks through the camera, he sees eight stones. And I don't want to give anything away because it's such a good story. But the very act of him going out there um, kind of opens a, a gateway. And that's all I'll say about it. But it, it's just. It's a very, very, very creepy story, and out of all the Stephen King Lovecraftian stories that I'm mentioning, uh, that's my favorite. I also really like Crouch End and Mrs. Todd's Shortcut quite a bit. So, now, uh, and I wanted to ask you guys the same thing: what What are your favorites, and why? Stephen King's Lovecraft. Well, story. I, I, I always loved Crouch End. I just thought it was a uh, well done. I'm also a sucker for Shubningarath as far as, it, it, you know, Lovecraftian beasties. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the possibility that that was Shubningarath was, you know... Um, I thought it transferred the film really well, too. Did, did I've you? never seen the film. It, it's good. In fact, I think it's on YouTube, Joe. Somebody put it on well, YouTube. Well, I, I'm a criminal because... I, in general, I don't watch much horror film. Um, I'm not a big horror film fan. Yeah, um, I, I know. I just did you have, who, have you guys read the story and seen the film? I've uh, seen the film. Yes. What was it? A film film or was it a made for TV production? It was made uh, for TV, but it was pretty high quality. Yeah, I think it was oh, okay. uh, USA or TNT. Okay. Yeah, TNT. I, I think it was TNT. Yeah. Did did you did you think did you think it was well done, Brian? I thought it was okay. I liked the story much better. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. The movie was passable, if I remember correctly. Wasn't it part of? Uh, I want to say. <laughs> what did you say? We lost. Yeah, I didn't. It sounded like a truck drove past or something. We, we, we lost didn't what hear you said. that, Brian. Yeah. I wanted to say, if I remember correctly, one of the cable stations did a Nightmare and Dreamscape miniseries. Yeah, that's it was right. part of that. That's right. It's on DVD as well. <laughs> Hang on. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll go to YouTube later and look for it. I, yeah. You know. <clears throat> I just never went there before, you know, as far as, like I said, I just don't do much horror. I I like drama. I like cops, criminals, and then yeah. I like truly weird. Yeah, I was up, I guess, uh, Friday night, I spent the whole night watching the Wallander series with Kenneth Branagh. The what? Wallander. Wallander. With oh. Kenneth Branagh. Very good. The original is much, much better. Yeah, was, uh, I, I went and read at the same time. Sorry, Pete. I went uh, and we, it. We, no, I mean the original TV version, uh, the Swedish version, right. which uh, we got subtitled. Right, I can get that subtitle too and I want to watch it, except it's I can't much write better. and read the subtitles at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got the, the DVD and whoever said it was Nightmares and Dreamscapes, they did, they did eight of the stories. And then they they put it on DVD. Um, How is that? Because I've been I've been back and forth wondering if that's I, worth. I getting. would definitely get it. Um, okay. It's got Battleground, Crouch End, of course, uh, Omni's Last Case, uh, Autopsy Room Four, and you know they've got a hell of a band. One, two, three, mm -hmm. four. That's only five. Where's the scissors? Eight. But. It, it's um, it's definitely a good DVD uh, set to. Ha it looks great on your shelf, and it's really fun to watch. 
I'm I'm with whoever said that. I think it was Brian said that that Crouch End was not as good as the, the story, yeah. but you know they they seldom are. It was it was very watchable. So. Hmm. Pardon me. And I can do any better. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I guess I'm not. <laughs> yeah, it's you. I'm, I'm missing the uh, missing. <laughs> there, how's that? That's a little better. Better. How's that? Technical issues. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, so anyway, uh, Crouch End and In, I can't recommend listening to those highly enough. And then Mrs. Todd's Shortcut, I I just think is, is great as well. Uh, to be honest, I don't really do audio books very much. I much prefer to read myself. I tend to get distracted too easily with audio. I'm okay watching a film if I've got something to catch my attention that I'm looking at, but if I'm just listening, anything will distract me, and I have to keep rewinding the damn thing. Sometimes yeah, I listen to audio books when I'm really, working. We're ahead, really, sorry. Dave, you, you and I, as being old folks here, shut up, Raleigh. That's um, true, you are. You know, we're in some ways... Um, and, and we're conditioned to the, 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 the medium of delivery. We grew up reading books somewhere, perhaps on some underlying psychological level. Books, words are meant to be read, you know. They had um, books? Mm. Pardon me? They had books when you were young? Oh, yeah. I thought everything was just pulled around the fireplace. Hey, Pete, they, they were on parchment. It's, they were on parchment and scrolls. I, I, I want to disagree with you, Joe. I don't think stories were meant to be read. I think stories were meant to be told. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I didn't They've say what they were. I didn't say what they were meant paper. to be. I, I'm saying when Dave and I were young, mm -hmm. okay, take a look at us. You know, when we're little kids reading, that's five plus decades ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. didn't listen to books. You're overestimating my age a bit. I went grey very young. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Five plus decades ago, I was just about born. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, all right. So Dave's younger than I am too, for Christ's sakes. But not much. Um, <laughs> can we can we get some adults on this show next week? <laughs> Actually, I learned to if read. I, can, I mean, about Sam, five, yeah, God, sure. look at Sammons. I think just he just started shaving two weeks ago. <laughs> Guy's a kid. I got an interesting story for you. Uh, speaking of that, I went check this out. Well, Joe, I, I went and got my haircut hair, last okay? night. It just came in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I went and got my haircut All last night. All mine red white. You can't even see how much there is anymore. <laughs> I got my haircut last night, and I said to the lady, I said, I said, I'm I'm 41 years old, and I still don't know what to say when I go get a haircut. How you know, cut it. That's all I know. She goes, Well, what usually goes wrong? She goes, Because you got a pretty thick head of hair. I said, Well, it kind of it seems to poof out here when they do it wrong. She goes, oh, you know why that is? She goes, if I know it's wrong, then I, I can do a better job. And she did a good job, I think. She goes, do you know why your hair does that on the sides? I'm like, no. She said, because it's beyond gray. It's white. And white is really, you know, a lot drier than regular hair. So it kind of does its own thing. So I'm like, my wife and oh. son love that because they love teasing me about having... It's not even gray anymore, Daddy. It's white. I was 17. <laughs> My mother was completely grey by the time she was 13. So oh, yeah. But, uh, so, yeah. I had a haircut but, in 1979, uh, I believe it was. Now, the, <laughs> go ahead, Joe. We're just creatures of the medium we grew up on. Uh, mm. I, I'm not saying it's right. Books were books. Mm -hmm. You set the chair, you opened it up, you read. You, you looked at the words, you held the book. There was this tango between you and the author, visually and tact and, and, and tactfully as well. I, um, I see what you're saying, Joe. I, 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 I think I with think me that... it is actually because I'm much too easily distracted. I mean, I can't read if there's anything else going on. I can't read TV on, music, any, or any kind of noise. That's what made me nocturnal. I used to read well, at night when my downstairs neighbor was asleep. So you, I, I, I think, though, you do make a mistake if you, and I'm not saying you're doing this, Joe, by, at all. I think that for me, I have times when I want to listen to a book. I have times when I want to read a book. For me, during the day, I'll typically read or the evening. Mm. But every night when I go to bed, 
I put some kind of audio on, whether it's an audio book or an audio drama, and that's, you know, you, you're, I'm like you, Dave, I get easily distracted unless I'm in bed. There's nothing to distract me. I enjoy laying there, relaxing at the end of the day and, and listening to a book. I was thinking it might be paranoia, the fact that if I've got headphones on, I can listen quite, but if I think something's happening outside of the headphones, I have to take one check. <laughs> what did you say, Brian? Go ahead, Brian. I was going to actually make a suggestion, um, going back to King and the Mythos, actually. Uh, the best reading book you've ever read. Now you've gone again. I feel yeah. like this is like those moments where it's like, this is the most important information about the Mythos. Yeah. <laughs> something, something's wrong with your I mic or something. Brian. It just, it's yeah. like those moments that you see in sitcoms. <clears throat> Can you resist? Yeah, Brian, your mic keeps getting squirrely. And we're getting like one of every six words. Oh boy! Is this better? Better? Six of each word. That's better. Yeah. What were you saying? I was going to say uh, perhaps the best audio book I've ever listened to. Oh man! <laughs> the best the conspiracy. <laughs> I'll never find out what the audio book is. <laughs> Brian Salmon <laughs> on the side here. Um, Brian Salmon. Type it in there, Brian. You get all these DVDs, you get all these books. What you need to do is get your butt out during the week and buy a new microphone. Yeah. <laughs> so we can hear you. <laughs> well, once Brian's got that figured out or he types it into the side here, um, the reason why I listen to a lot of um, yeah, audio type it books the side. is because I travel um, about one or two hours a day, especially before mm -hmm. I, I do the job that I do now. And um, I would do like five, six hours in the truck, and listening to music, I'd pat, I'd start to nod off. I'd fall asleep, so I needed. James, something. my wife is the same way. She drives forty-five minutes from here to Dallas each way every day, and it goes so quick for her when she can. I, I've got an Audible.com membership, so I get it's like twenty-five bucks a month, and you get two free books that each one would have cost you twenty-five to forty alone. Yeah, but how? Okay, here's my question. Mm -hmm. How much of the stuff, and, and I'm not your average reader, I understand that, mm -hmm. um, but but how much of the, the, the work that I want to read is available on audio books? Well, I've got I to gotta agree with that, Joe. A lot of stuff that, uh, well, it's eat heck, go into my local bookstore. I'm not going to find the books that I want to read. Yeah, absolutely. This, like, a Pretty Mouth is not in a normal bookstore. No, heck, okay. Uh, I had to kind of kick, beg, and squeal about the Book of Cthulhu to get it in my chapters. You know, I, I'm a fanatic. I, I absolutely adore Cisco. We don't have audio books. Kiernan. Kiernan's one of the greatest writers there are. I adore Kiernan's books. We lost Sam's. I think, I think uh, he made fun of him too much. No, he's probably rebooting to see if he can get his mic to work. Okay. Where's Where's Kiernan's audiobooks? You know, I... Joe, mm -hmm. not to not to kind of point fingers, but do you have any audiobooks of your own work? Yeah, right. Okay, sure. Um, well, your uh, stop, stuff at Love Threat is If on you're going to sit there and smoke dope, you better pass the joint, brother. Hey, I'm just asking. I'm not mm -hmm. picking. Um, your uh, your Lovecraft is on is audio. One short story that Julia Morgan did. Okay. One of my King in Yellow things on YouTube. Um, which I will look for it. I'll a look wonderful, for it a wonderful job. It's called Chasing Shadows. Joe, um, Joe, that's not true. You got stuff on the on my magazine. Oh, I, I, oh yeah, right. It, it, I, Don't knock down it, when I try and openly uh, suggest things on the show, Joe. I'm trying to help <laughs> out. Well, no, what the fanboy is supposed to do. Okay. I have to say, if there's one book I would love to read, as listen to an audio book of, because I think it would just work so well, it'd be an orphan palace. I would oh, really like to hear. No, that would be interesting. I, I'll give you that. That'd be an. In, it'd be difficult to do well, to but if it was done well, it'd be great. To to read Joe's stuff, I, I think you'd have to have someone, and I mean this totally as a compliment. You'd have to have someone that really knows what they're doing, is a really good reader. Um, you well, know, for, whoever for a, read for a book left novel, San I mean. Whoever read Tark San left San Santiago, I felt bad for, and I thought they did a really good job considering 
they're they're probably a regular nice person, you know. Um, <laughs> I think I forget who it was, but I even remember them saying, "Oh, wow, well, I'm sorry, I volunteered for this." <laughs> yeah, I bet they. I bet they did. I, I'll bet you the next time you wanted to hand out assignments, they said, "There's no way I'm touching Boulder." Uh, it I should mean, be someone that can read really, really well, uh, have a good grasp of the English language, and preferably an accent. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Before uh, we lose be him again, Brian, Brian Sam is back. Book. Oh, Quick he's got man, glasses before we, before on it now. Happens again. He's serious we now. Let's, we got to pay attention now because he looks very official. He's got glasses and pink headphones. And Let's you can't this. pick on him anymore. So what was this book, I wasn't Brian? picking on him. I what like was, the guy. What was this, this guy book? has bought eight of my stories in the past year. <laughs> okay, so he's got he's got a couple mental defects. I already know. Accounting for taste. I mean, you know. What's, First, the, uh, what's the book? Can anyone hear me any better? Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's that's great. Great now. Okay, that's good. perfect. Um... I forgot what the hell I was talking about. Oh, uh, some audio book, and I think you said oh, 20 years ago. Yes. Um, getting back to King and The Mist, the best audio book I ever heard was Stephen King's The Mist. It oh. was recorded. Yes, it was recorded in what they called 3D sound. I it had that. sound effects. It's not a reading. It's an audio drama, yes. which I, I love. And, and, and I do have drama. that. I think I've actually got that on cassette somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's what is that? I still, I still have it on cassette, but I think I found a copy well, somewhere. I mention, what is a cassette? <laughs> it's sort of, it's sort of like an eight-track. Um, yes, but simpler. It's like a VHS. No, better, audio. better than an eight-track. Yeah, those were those were a little. I never could find the song I was looking for on eight tracks. Oh no! You know what turned me off is one of the very first eight tracks I ever heard was Zappa's Hot Rats, and right in the middle of um, the gumbo variations. I mean, the jam is really working incredibly, and all of a sudden it stops to change tracks. And mm, for exactly five seconds, I gotta wait to hear the solo again. James is like, what in the hell is an 8-track? No way. I'm just listening to him, to him complain. It sounds like me when I'm complaining about, why is my internet taking 30 seconds to download? It's terrible. Oh, I remember when Back to the Future came out, walking to the mall to get get it on, on record because I wanted the soundtrack. Huey Lewis in the News singing, uh, um, what was it? Power, power, love. power of Love. Power Love, yeah. What? Doesn't it blow your mind we're in Back to the Future's future right now? Where is my flying car? Yeah. Or Where, I want my, my hoverboard. Yes. Well, even that. We have the technology, damn it. Let's just make it commercial. <laughs> anyway, uh, where were we? Stephen King books. Uh, audio stuff, all the fun stuff. Let's try and stay oh, on track. Oh, the fanboy. Texas back on track. Mm -hmm. Um. Just to throw it out there, uh, I don't know if it's an actual short... I believe it's a short story, but I actually uh, liked The Night Flyer. Oh, that's a good oh, one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good I, yeah story. Story. I think yeah. that's a... I know it's a cliché creature with the vampire, but I think I think that's a... a it had a nice atmosphere with... Uh, especially with the movie. My favorite uh, part in the, in the short looking... story is when he's peeing into the urinal... And all he sees yes. is the, the blood <laughs> going into the urinal. They show that in the movie, and it's just a very creepy moment. <laughs> um, but they, I, I thought that had a great atmosphere to it, where the guy's trying to find, like trying to find this legend, and gets what he wishes for, and really wishes he didn't find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Do you guys agree with me? What I, I really want to know what you guys' favorite King's Lovecraftian stories are. Um, um, mine is Crouch In. Yeah. Let me let me go through I'm the list again. My answer. Yeah. Pete, put it down. That's my answer. Why well, more than one people can like the same thing? No, no, they cannot. Stephen King signed that. That's nice. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Have a balloon. <laughs> That's weird. I bought a book at a used bookstore yesterday that... Just one? 
No, several. Okay. But it was it's a signed copy of a, a ghost story book and it says it's autographed, it says um it's called it's called the harrowing. It's, it says in, in to Ruth, hope I scare you. I'll and be right back, guys. Okay. And that's signed by the author. I'm thinking, why am I buying this? It's, uh, why? Why is this? Why did this Ruth, whoever she is, get rid of it? It's kind of intriguing. I was going to say, how did the author know your your real name's Ruth? I don't know. It's freaky. <laughs> <laughs> well, why does anybody get rid of books? You know, I mean, it could have been a mistake. She could have died. Yeah. There could be a million reasons. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Some people true. don't put attachments onto books like uh, others do. Well, I, you know, that you're right. I, I just, you know, I kind of think uh, an autographed book, there's a higher attachment to it, but maybe not for a lot of people. No, there's, there's not. There. Well, there, I, I've been to quite a few places that had a lot of notable writers and most often didn't bring books to have autographed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can sit and have a conversation with a writer that, you know, a Lumley or a Campbell or whoever, uh, you know, going to breakfast for a couple hours with Brian Lumley is a hell of a lot more important to me than having him sign a couple books. Oh, I agree. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I don't know, I, I'm just weird about that. It's like autograph, okay, nice, yeah. Um, but I, I, I used to be I, I fanatic about getting really. things autographed, but I got to the stage where I just can't be bothered anymore. It's really not worth the effort. Well, I used to be I, the I, guy I that used to truck around the convention with huge bags full of books and magazines again, every single story signed. I'm the last oh, guy yeah, in the world I can, that's I it. can remember at the second Necronomicon, you know, there was a, 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 a big party for Ramsey Campbell down in the whatever room, it, well, this room wasn't the lobby, but whatever, the green room, okay, and and there were a couple hundred people in this room, and at one point, a fan came up, and he had a hand truck, and from mm -hmm. the bottom to the top of the hand truck were boxes of Ramsey Campbell books. I mean, I don't know how many he had, and he wanted them all signed. You know, and he was very nice, and Campbell is absolutely, you know, really adorable guy, sweetheart. And he sat there and, you know, talking to the guy, Ramsey Campbell, Ramsey Campbell, Ramsey Campbell, Ramsey, you know. Um, How many people behind you were swearing up a storm because of this guy, Joe? Uh, no, everybody was, was cool about it. All right. You know? um, hey, it, in its own way, it was very endearing. Here's a, oh, of course. Here's here's a massive fan of Ramsey Campbell, you know, who's got this one chance to meet him, and he wants his book signed. There's nothing think, wrong with that. I think um, if there's it's one a landmark in his life, isn't it? If there's one thing in my collection I've got that has a, a great attachment, it's a, an obscure literary magazine with a story in it by Ramsey that he signed for me. And the, the only reason is I used to work in a uh, comic come record come bookshop and we had him over for a signing and he was sat in the room next door and he actually came up with an idea for a story and started writing notes for it on, <coughs> on the sofa about sort of 30 feet away and uh, it's, this is actually that story that he signed for me so oh, I don't wow. think I'd ever part with that one and on yeah, well, the same, same occasion, Brian Tolbert is sitting on, uh, on uh, the other side of the room and he's looking through into, into here and he sees our cat eating and that image of that cat eating is actually in the tale of One Bad Rat. Oh, that's and I great. Actually, I actually bought the original art of that uh, page off of Brian. Charged me £200 for it, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, and he didn't have all the nice colour on, but no, I still had to have it. <laughs> as, as much as I agree with what Joe says, the um, like I would much rather sit down with the author, mm. talk with him, get ideas from him, um, see well, where he's There's also the thing, I, I think it's also what I call the folk club syndrome. A lot of people go to see a writer when they come to the local library because they're interested and they get something signed because they're there. They don't really care. Right. It's like small time folk uh, artists, uh, folk musicians, 
nearly all of their albums are signed because the only place they ever sell the damn things is it's little folk club gigs, and they always sign them, and you always find them second hand in charity shops. <laughs> In the end, and, and, and not something somebody's gone out their way to get a signature. They just happen to be there. Well, well speak, the, go sorry, ahead, sorry. No, uh, go ahead, James. Go ahead. What, I agree with what Joe said, but I'd rather meet with the author, talk with them, and everything. But uh, before I had that kind of courage, um, that book being signed was like uh, a landmark, a, a little trophy of, uh, I got to meet this person, and I got him to sign, like, this was evidence that this happened. Uh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Uh, no, just, no, I'm not saying, I didn't you know. say that you, you mentioned it as such. I just, I'm just bringing it up as that that's usually what a lot of fans look at signatures as. Mm. It's like, this is, this is my hero, this is my person I, I adore. And this is a, a nice little um, notch on the belt that this has happened. I'm I the last person. now and I remember my first ever encounter with an author. I say I worked in this shop, and we used to go down Titan Distributors, uh, and uh, we found a box of books down there once when we got in our stock, and it, it was The House of Cthulhu by Brian Lumley, the Weird Book Press edition. And we mm. had about four copies, and we brought them home, and they sold instantly. And I desperately wanted to get some more. Titan didn't have any. Looking through the Exchange and Mart listings magazine, I saw a little advert that said sort of House of Cthulhu copies available, and it was it was from a D Lumley. And I thought, give it a go. So I wrote to her, wrote a letter in these old pre-computer days, and a few days later I got a phone call, and it was Brian Lumley. And I was like pacing around the room. Brian Lumley rang me up. He actually spoke to me, a real writer. It was like my absolute first ever meeting with somebody who writes books. I mean, since then, I mean, we, we I haven't seen him for a long time now. I should see him at uh, the World Fantasy Con. But we we got to be pretty good friends. And uh, the second volume of his uh, Necroscope trilogy is actually dedicated to me. But uh, oh, that's cool. nice. But. Um, yeah. What was just to? I apologize. What's the? Uh, what's your? To keep on track. What's your favorite Stephen King book for Lovecraftian um, stuff? That's really difficult because I've been sitting here quite quiet all e all evening because I don't. I haven't actually read most of this stuff. Uh, the, the one that immediately comes to mind is Jerusalem's Lot because I actually do remember that one, <laughs> and I have actually read that. But a lot of these stories that you've mentioned, I haven't actually read. Mm -hmm. My question well, I did really is, end. did I miss anyone, did I miss any Stephen King Lovecraftian stories? I don't uh, think I did, but maybe, who knows. I, I think we touched on them, but I could have missed one or two over the years. Well, we didn't, we didn't really uh, pay much lip service to Stephen King's It, other than the fact that we all said that we really liked it. Um, but aside from that, I can't think of any off the top of my head that we I missed. I haven't read that either yet. <laughs> Oh so my gosh, Dave, shame on you. Yeah, yeah but um, I've got heaps and heaps and heaps of books to read, and people keep writing them and saying, please review this, Dave. So how the hell am I going to get time to go and read something Stephen King wrote 30 years ago? Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll stop Hello. sending them to you, Dave. That's, that's no problem. <laughs> Brian, all what the did you... books that we've, all the stories we've talked about, the one that I cannot remember is Grandma. Um, oh, that's I remember it vaguely. I, I read the original appearance of that in Weird Book. Um, don't remember a great deal of detail about it, but I know it actually did. It was just it was sort of a thing on the doorstep type mm. story. Yeah, and they also uh, made it into an episode of the new Twilight Zone back in the eighties. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh really? DVD somewhere. Yeah, really good one too. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, what's, your, what's your Stephen King fave? Who? Uh, Joe. Oh, I said that earlier. Crouch in. Crouch in. Okay. And uh, Pete. I gotta be honest. I've never heard of Crouch End. Oh, it's a good story. Yeah. It's in know. Nightmares and Dreamscapes. A very famous street okay. in London where I think Peter Straub used to live. Brian Lumley used to live at one point. Um, I think That's Clive why Barker Stephen used King to live there. based it there. Yeah. Because they <laughs> That's why you based the story there. So, you know, from what I've read. Uh, but I will say for the third time, uh, listen, uh, I highly recommend you listen to In in Just After Sunset and Crouch End in Nightmares and Dreamscapes because um, they add an extra dimension to it. As, as Joe said, many stories do, but it really adds to the creepiness factor 
and that new story in the tall grass by Stephen King and Joe Hill is extremely as we were disturbing. talking I put that on my Kobo so uh, I'm going to be looking forward to reading that okay now I really feel old what's a Kobo oh sorry it's uh, Canada's version of a Kindle oh okay okay Actually, Canada's version of a nook because it does EPUBs. Oh, is it? E I was about to ask if it's EPUB or Mobi. Yeah, uh, uh, can do both depending. Does it? Uh, oh. uh, well, I cheat. <laughs> well, you can convert have, them in uh, the caliber, yeah. Yeah, e caliber is uh, godsend for e readers. Um, but yeah, so I'm looking forward to reading that. So thanks for the suggestion, Mike. Yeah. Um, let's see. Jason V. Brock. Anybody know him? No. Met him by reputation. And he's uh, well, he just came out with, I guess he's coming out with, oh, what was the? Milton's Children. Milton's Children, yeah, thank you. Uh, he's going to send me a, an advance copy to read it. It sounds really interesting. It's got some good advance reviews by, let's see, Joshi and uh, Ramsey Campbell, I think. So. Can't remember what, anyway, the reason why I brought him <laughs> up is uh, he's going to be on here on the 19th, so we're going to talk to him about his Milton's children. So, so that ought to be fun. Now, I apologize. I know we're probably wrapping up, but I'm going to have to run away. So, guys, thank you so much for having me. You guys sure. are uh, it's always a pleasure. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. Take care. Hey, Mike, can I hijack yeah. this for a minute? Go yeah. right ahead. Brian. Hijack all you want. Yeah. Hi, Jack. All you want? We've never met. No, we have not. Nice to meet you, finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. I think we've talked via email and whatnot, but you know, it's it's finally great to put a voice and a moving face to the picture that sits so static. Yes, All part yes, of it the is. Using service. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of you know. I've got some good neighbors and so forth, but you know, I, I talk to them small talk. You know, the internet is just so great to be able to connect with people that you really have things in common with. Oh yeah, um, my co-partner in many a book, uh, Glenn Barris, I met because of Facebook. Yeah. Uh, if I hadn't been on Facebook, I never would have met him. We never would have started doing books together. Yeah. If, if there wasn't Facebook, I would not have met Glenn. I would not have met Brian, and I would not have sold the stories I have. No. Uh, yeah, I wish we could get Glenn on just to chat sometime. So. Yeah, I've, I've asked him. Uh, I don't think he has a camera. Hmm. But he did mention something about getting a big old payday recently, so maybe I'll try yeah. to bully him. One. Well, even if he doesn't want to get a camera, as long as he has a mic, then it'll just show his picture on the screen while, oh, while he talks. Okay. You know, you don't necessarily have to have a webcam to be in on the chats. Well, I have a conference call lined up for him uh, in a couple days. I'll mention it to him again. Cool. Cool. Um, anyway, I think I'm about ready to go eat supper. Appreciate you guys being on. Yeah, my and wife and kids just got home after three days away, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you probably want to go see I'm them. I'm sure they're looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> No, probably not. I don't mm. set sarcasm there at all. No, well, there wasn't any. I just, you know, straight up fact. There, there goes the end of their vacation. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Appreciate no. that. No problem. You won't be going out on the yacht this summer. <laughs> yeah. You're, you just I saw got the, your, I saw your invitation I saw is your revoked. Picture from the yacht. Your invitation is revoked, buddy. <laughs> For the yacht. Yeah, I'm not a yacht kind of guy. Well, we will be here next Sunday, and we're going to be talking. That's uh, today's the 6th, 7 and 6 is 13. Um, it wouldn't be the 19th, would it? It would be the 20th. That we're gonna, it, it's every Sunday. Anyway, <coughs> I don't know what we're talking about next Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, but we will be here. And um, anybody watching this, if you have any requests for topics in the future, um, be sure to email them to me. You can go to lovecraftzine.com and, and, and email me from there if you want. Uh, or Michael Davis Writer at gmail.com. Um, Brian, Dave, Joe, Pete, everybody, thanks for being here. I appreciate it.
Thanks for having us. Thanks for the invite. I'll see you guys next week.